Amen. Hey, I'm going to invite you to take your Bible, your Bible app, and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 22. Luke 22 is our text today. As we're continuing our Son of God series, we're obviously leaning into Easter for the next few weeks as we work our way through the, the Scriptures towards that. But I would encourage you to uh, find this passage and join us. If you don't have a Bible and you're in the room, then uh, grab one of the Bibles that are in the seats around you and turn to page 1048. 1048, you'll be able to find Luke 22 and follow along with us as we look at the scriptures. And uh, as always, if you're in the room and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of those with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, if you're joining us online uh, and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then by all means, request one. You can let the service hosts know. You can email us at the church office. We would love for you to have a Bible and read it and apply it to your life as well. And, and, uh, and as Robert, I think, mentioned just a moment ago, we're going to be celebrating communion later on. If you don't have your elements together, you don't have bread or crackers or wine or juice together, then now would be a great time to grab that and uh, get ready for uh, our time of worship together corporately later in the service. Hey, uh, I just got to mention uh, one thing before we dive into the message, uh, and that is, that is this. This October... Uh, 24th, in fact, we're going to be going to the Holy Land, assuming the world doesn't end before then. And uh, uh, look, you got to assume that with the news and, and stuff. But we're, we're planning our, our trip to the Holy Land. We started it in 2020, and that got canceled. 21, that got canceled. So we're going to do it in 22. And, uh, and I am, realize there's a lot of people who go, okay, I'm, I'm just not traveling anywhere anymore. But if you are interested in, in going and walking where Jesus walked, if you want to uh, be stretched in your biblical faith because you've been reading the stories and now you can go and see the places and let the scriptures come alive in a fresh way for you, then uh, we'd love for you to sign up or next Saturday at, uh, in here after the Saturday night service about 6.15, I'll be hosting an informational time, uh, answer questions about the Holy Land trip. So whether you're already signed up and you're going and you want to get some more clarity or if you're just interested in finding out more about that, let me uh, just let you know and invite you. And if you're joining us online and you want to go and you're not here to come to the meeting, then email me and I'll get you some information for that as well. Maybe we'll set up a Zoom call meeting for those who are not in town that want to uh, go on the Holy Land. So, but I, I just, look, my heart's desire is to take everybody with me. They don't make planes that big. Uh, but, uh, but on the other hand, uh, if you are interested and that's something that's on your bucket list and you'd like to join us, we would love to have you. We're gonna have a great time. Uh, we're trying to take a group of about 40. We already have about 25 committed to going. So uh, we'd love to take a few more of you if you would like to participate. So how many of you like to eat? All right, this is gonna be easy. How many of you after the service are planning on going and getting something to eat? Yeah, see, that, that's most of you in this room. And, uh, and if, sorry about those online, we can't take you with us. Uh, but, uh, but here's the thing, you know, it's so easy to get a group of friends together after the service, right? And you go, hey, who wants to go eat? You guys want to go eat? Right? And, and everybody wants to go eat. That's easy. And everybody's excited. We're going to go eat together. We're going to have a great time together. Where do you want to go? <laughs> now, that's a whole nother emotion that suddenly comes up right there, Right? Well, anyway, and, and you know, and by the way, there's some of you that have a set group of friends and you all go to the same restaurant at the same time on the same day. I think that's brilliant because no one has to fight about where you're going. I, I always know there's somebody in that group going, can't we go someplace else? Because, you know, this isn't my place. Anyway, but uh, look, it's difficult to figure out where we're going to go eat because people lie. And, and in my experience, sorry, ladies, it's the wives who lie. Okay? I, I said sorry. This is my experience. Because it's like, hey, we're going to go out to eat, and I'll say, Meralda, where do you want to go? And she lies because she says, I don't care. I don't care. And I know it's a lie because early in the early days, I would go, like, call her bluff. Okay, let's go to Taco Bell. Let's go to Burger King. No, I don't want to go there. So you do care. Okay. Well, how about you? And then, and then she would, we'd play the, the guessing game. And I would guess at what she's in the mood for. And I would be wrong 15 to 20 times. Wait, we don't even have that many restaurants to go to, right? And, and so, you know, you have to figure it out. And, and so obviously you do care. And by the time you, you figure out where you're going, you're exhausted just deciding where to go eat. 
Anyway, I don't even have time to rant about indecisive orders for the same places you've eaten at a hundred times, but <laughs> we agree that we want to go out to eat. We're unified in our desire to dine out together, um, and then we fight about where to eat. Well, today we're talking about a meal. We're talking about the supper, the last supper the consistent centerpiece of Christian worship for almost 2,000 years. Uh, if you do a little bit of background, then it is the week of Passover celebration. Every single Jew celebrates Passover. It's everybody remembering that God set them free from slavery in Egypt through the Passover lamb, through the miracles, through the death of the firstborn in Egypt, and, and God used that, and all of that points to Jesus and Jesus takes the opportunity to not only worship with his disciples, celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples, but taking that event, that Passover event, and connecting it directly to himself. Because he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the eternal Passover Lamb. There's no more sacrifices needed. And uh, Jesus gathers his disciples. He sends some of them to prepare the Passover meal. And we're going to pick up in verse 14. And this is what it says. And when the hour came, Jesus reclined at table and the apostles with him. And Jesus said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they, the apostles, began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. So we're talking about the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, the Eucharist, and, and understand, every single flavor and tribe of Christianity observes the supper. We all go to the same table to worship. But I got to tell you, for the last 500 years at least, we've been fighting and arguing about the supper and what it means and how to take it and who can take it. In, in other words, it, it's crazy that the, the one thing that Jesus said, this is what I want you to do as my followers, to remember me, to remember this by... Uh, to, to bring unity to all of us who remember Jesus' death and resurrection, it's the, it's the one thing that we can't agree on. We, we let it divide us. And so today what I want to do is talk about the supper. And then I want us to celebrate communion. I want us to celebrate Jesus. Uh, now, one thing that... that everybody agrees on, every church agrees on, every single Bible-believing church, every single uh, mainline church, that, and is this, the supper is for followers of Jesus. Okay? So if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus, then we want you to take the supper with us. It's for you. But if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, by the way, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, we want you to be one. We want you to, to come to that place where you commit yourself to following Jesus because that's where life is found. That's where forgiveness is found. That's where hope is found. That's where freedom is found. But we know that uh, some of you aren't there yet. Uh, if you're close, talk to us afterwards. We'd love to pray with you, talk with you, and share with you how you can follow Jesus with your life. But if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, the supper isn't really for you. It really isn't because it doesn't help you, it doesn't hurt you. But uh, if you take it and you don't understand why and you don't believe the why, then you're just doing a religious thing and no one here is for you just being religious. 
Okay, we don't, we don't want anyone to just practice religion because that's just death. But if you have a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ, then we want you to be able to join in and celebrate. So I'm gonna talk about a little bit of history. Some of you will be not used to that in, in church, so sorry about that. Uh, I'm gonna give a little bit of explanation and then definitely a challenge and invitation to worship. So uh, first let's look at the, uh, briefly at the historic views of the supper. The historic views of the supper. Now, um, I, I just want to kind of recap the dominant understandings of the, the common thoughts about communion, the different tribes, different groups. And, and I know that a lot of you came out of different uh, groups. You were raised in different uh, churches than, than ones like Calvary, and that's okay. But I'm just going to recap what maybe you were taught growing up. So the first view I want to look at is one called transubstantiation which is a big word, and it's how the, the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox define communion. It's how they define what happens when the priest blesses the elements. So they believe that when the priest blesses the elements, the essence of those elements transform from bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus that there is an actual transformation. Now, it doesn't look any different. They don't, you know, the, the bread doesn't look any different. The, the wine doesn't look any different. But they believe that the essence of those, those physical uh, elements have been transformed, hence transubstantiation, into the body and blood of Christ, which is why only the priest handles the elements. It's why they tell you you have to observe a Eucharistic fast. And it's why uh, they believe only Catholics, or if you're Orthodox, Orthodox members can partake in communion in the Eucharist. Uh, it's closed communion. It's closed to anybody who's not a Catholic, anybody who's not an Orthodox. So I was talking with Father Chauncey, who's the head priest here at Our Lady of the Lake in town. And, uh, and I've been there to worship with him a few times. And uh, he's been at some of our services as well. And, uh, and I, I said to him, uh, you know, I, I hadn't done this yet, but I said, hey, when I'm, when I'm worshiping with you guys, can I, can I take communion with you? And he said, no. <laughs> and I said, why not? And he goes, because you're not a Catholic. <laughs> and I said, but what if the person serving doesn't know that? And he goes, come on, don't do that. And I goes, all right. <laughs> I go, so what happens if I walk up and you're there? And he says, well, I'll bless you, but I won't give you the elements. I was like, all right, fair enough. But, but see, it's only for their people because they believe, hey, this is the body and blood of Christ. And uh, if you're going to eat that, you got to do it when you're in good standing as a Catholic or good standing as an Orthodox member. So it's transubstantiation. And then there's consubstantiation, which is the, the Lutheran viewpoint. Although Lutherans don't like to call it consubstantiation. I'll, I'll just tell you that. They don't call it this. They believe that when the elements are blessed, the body and blood are in, with, and under the bread and wine. That the uh, essence of the bread and wine remain bread and wine, but Christ's body and blood are spiritually present in those elements. They also practice closed communion in that you have to be a Lutheran who agrees with their theology to partake communion with them. And then there's the, the view called real presence. Now, this is what came out of and is practiced by Reformed churches. Uh, and this is where Christ uh, is believed that Christ is especially present when we take communion. In other words, the priest doesn't bless it or the preacher doesn't bless it, but they believe that Christ is especially present when we take communion. And through our faith in him, we spiritually eat his body and drink his blood. But nothing actually happens to the bread and wine. Not its essence, not spiritually. Uh, it, it, it doesn't transform or anything like that. John Calvin, who's kind of, kind of the father of the Reformed Church movement, said uh, that by faith, believers partake of the body and blood of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit who pours the life of Christ into them. And, and then the fourth view is symbolic memorial, which is sort of the free church tradition. Free church is like Baptist churches. Even most of the evangelical churches, most of the Pentecostal churches are symbolic memorial churches. Uh, and that means that the supper is a symbol of Jesus' sacrifice. That this is a symbol that is just to remind us that, that Jesus died for us and was raised from the dead. And it's a time to give thanks, to celebrate, to repent, and recommit. Now, historically, all of the churches practiced some kind of close or closed communion. In other words, they, they prevented people from taking it. They said, you can't take it, you can. Uh, only members can take it, or only people who are Catholics, or, or you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, almost every church historically had some season of that in their history. 
Uh, but let me tell you what, what we kind of are convinced of right here at Calvary. We invite all followers of Jesus to join us in remembering and celebrating the death and resurrection of our Savior. Okay, if you're a follower of Jesus, we want you to join in. Uh, and I've given you a brief history, but I just want you to know no matter what church background you come from, or if you have no church background, then uh, we still want you to know that if Jesus has forgiven your sins, changed your life, and you're committed to him, we invite you to join us at the table of Jesus. So let's just, let's just see how many different backgrounds we have. How many of you are raised Catholic? Okay. How many of you are raised Lutheran? Okay. How many of you came out of Reformed churches? Okay. How many of you came out of free church tradition? How many of you came out of no church tradition? <laughs> see, we got, we got all types in here. All of those viewpoints were, were taught us or none of them were taught to us. And, and that's okay because our love for Jesus and our confession of Christ as Savior and Lord and the reality of the Holy Spirit who is in us unites us. And when we come to the table, hey, I appreciate that, but when we come to the table, we're coming to table as family because we're one in Christ. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Holy Spirit who unites us in the mission of Christ and in the family of God. And so uh, that's my particular viewpoint. That's our particular viewpoint. That's how we practice this. And so if, uh, if you're with us in that, we want you to be able to join us in celebrating Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, now that you've had a, a history and theology lesson that you didn't really want, I want to discuss the purpose of the supper. Because I think there's a, a, a reason that Jesus instituted this and told us to practice it on a regular basis. And, and churches and theologians are going to debate its meaning uh, until Jesus comes again and settles it. But I want to get really practical because in just a few moments, we're going to celebrate communion together. We're going to, to remember Jesus' sacrifice. And in fact, uh, I'm going to share really two purposes, four if you count all the words used, that two primary reasons that I think Jesus instituted the supper for us as the family of God. The, the first one is for us to be reminded and remember. To remind and remember. Now, I'm going to jump over to 1 Corinthians 11, where the Apostle Paul teaches about the supper. And he recaps what Jesus said, but he also tells us a little bit of the why. Listen to what he says, beginning in verse 23. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He wants us to be reminded and so whatever else you believe about communion as we partake, it's to remind us. To remind us that Jesus died to pay for our sins. To remind us that Jesus defeated death and set us free from the hold that sin has on our life. To be reminded that God loves us and demonstrated his love through the cross for you and for me. He wants us to be reminded of these things. And, and when we celebrate, God wants us to remember. Remember that we are created by him and for him. Remember that we are redeemed by him and adopted by him. Remember that we are sent on a mission for him. Remember that while we deserve hell, because of the grace of God and Jesus Christ demonstrated on the cross, we get heaven. And, and, and we want to remember this. Remember that that we are hopeless apart from Christ and that this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Remember. You see, when we, when we take communion, we pause to remember the primary world-altering and life-changing event in all of history, the death and resurrection of Jesus. 
Because if we remember this, if we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, I, I, th this is a secret for all of us, okay? It's not really a secret, but I'm just gonna tell you. It, the more you remember that Jesus died for you, the more that that takes the priority of your thought life, then the more it's gonna affect your attitude and your actions every single day. It'll change your heart. It'll impact your relationships. Because when we remember, okay, when we remember that we are loved by God, it makes it a whole lot easier to be patient and kind to others. Think about it. If you're dwelling on the reality that God loves you, it's easier to be patient with people. It's easier to show kindness toward people. When you are remembering that, that all of your sins are forgiven because Jesus shed his blood for you, guess what it's easier to do? Give grace. Give grace to the idiots that live around you. <laughs> right? Yeah, you're, look, you and I, we're all thinking the same thing. What an idiot. Look, aren't you glad that idiots get the grace of God? Because otherwise, you'd be out of luck. Right? Come on, we'd all be out of luck. But if, if God's poured out his grace on us and you're mindful of that, then when somebody offends you, it's gonna be way easier for you to forgive them. When you remember that you are accepted by God, even in your rebellion, even in your defiance, even in your failures, it is so much easier to welcome people and to be welcoming toward them. And when you remember that heaven is your home, that nothing in this world can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, um, it's much easier to endure with joy. See, we want to remember one purpose of communion is to remind us and for us to remember. The other reason is to reflect and recommit. Continuing in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the apostle says this, I'm, I'm in Luke, so I have to change. <clears throat> Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. You see, this is an opportunity for us to reflect and recommit. And Paul warns us about taking communion lightly. He warns us about the, the effects of, of just being casual about this observance. Now, Luke ends his account by Jesus mentioning the betrayal and the disciples freaking out. Now, we know that Judas is the betrayer, right? We all know it's coming. And we assume that they all see it coming too, but they don't. They are completely unaware that Judas is about to betray Jesus. Because they're arguing. Is it you? Is it me? Could I do it? You know. And they don't know, and they're, and they're all freaking out about this possibility that they could be the one. And the truth is, all of us are capable of betraying Jesus. Every one of us is tempted to deny Jesus, to abandon him, and to betray him. And communion is a time to reflect. It's a time to reflect on our failures to get honest with God and to confess our sins. You know, every time we celebrate communion, we kind of give you a time to reflect. We encourage you to take time to reflect. We drag it out a little bit so you'll have a little bit of time. Because here's what we want. We want you to get honest with God and to say, God, here's where I failed you. And I'm sorry. Because when you do that, when we confess our sins... God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to purify us of all unrighteousness. That's his promise. 
We want you to reflect. We want you to confront your own sinfulness because in doing that, you're going to come to that place of confession. And when you confess, then you're going to experience the mercy of God, which is a wonderful thing. And it's going to lead you to a place where after you confess and receive mercy, you're forgiven. Then you get to rejoice in God's goodness. You get to celebrate the blessings that God has poured out on you because of his mercy. And when we are celebrating God's goodness because of his mercy, it leads us to a place where we recommit. We want to recommit. See, you're a follower of Jesus. Most of you in this room, most of you tuning in, you're a follower of Jesus already. You've proclaimed Jesus Lord. You made a commitment to follow him, to serve him, and to obey him. That's what it means to call Jesus Lord. And communion is a moment when we celebrate the grace of God and renew our commitment to Jesus. In other words, we don't have to go back to the beginning, but we come to a place where, hey, today we're going to observe communion, and we do it about once a month here at Calvary. And we want to call you to that place of reflection and saying, okay, I've messed up, but you know what? I want to do better. I want to serve God better. I want to follow Jesus better. I want to give myself to him again. And, and that's what the purpose of this time is. And so every time we celebrate, we ask you to reflect and to recommit. And, and if you've been here any length of time, you know when I share this, I say I usually have a specific challenge that's related to the message, something we've been talking about. Are you ready to give grace? Are you ready to say yes? Are you ready to do this? And, and tonight, I want to share with you just a couple of prayers that I'm encouraging you to pray to God. You say, you're going to give me prayers to pray? Well, these are the formula, formulas. They're not the actual prayers that you need to pray, but these are things that I, I'm hoping that you will pray in your life. First one is, Jesus, I will follow you. I hope in your time of recommitment, you will say something like, Jesus, I, I want to follow you better. I mean, you've already decided to follow, so you're saying, hey, Jesus, I'm going to stop chasing after ungodly things. I'm going to lay aside all these things that are distracting me from you and pulling me from you, and I'm going to focus on obedience and faithfulness as a child of God. Now, all of us have things that are pulling on us. All of us have things that are distracting us. All of us have things that at times we pursue when we shouldn't. The question is, are you coming to a regular place where you're saying, God, I, I want to change that, and Jesus, I want to follow you better. That's what I hope communion does for you. It's a time of commitment again when you say, Jesus, I will follow you, and Jesus, I will represent you. Jesus, I want to represent you. Because you are my Lord, I want to sacrifice my opinions and my values, and I want to embrace the character and values of Jesus. You know, I, I mention it all the time. You can't represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. And, and I recognize that, that when people look at me, they judge Jesus. See, they, when they look at you, they're judging Jesus. That's why we want to represent Jesus better. And so we want to reflect his character. So God, help me to love and forgive and serve like my Savior. That's a prayer of recommitment, saying, Jesus, I, I want to represent you better. And then, Jesus, I will proclaim you. You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 that when we celebrate communion, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So what you're saying when you say, Jesus, I will proclaim you, is thank you, Jesus, that you died for my sins and that you set me free from death and hell. Thank you that you've given me eternal life. And Jesus, I realize that salvation is not for me only. Jesus, I don't want to be selfish with the gift of salvation that you gave me. So help me to share it with my family, with my friends, with the people in my sphere of influence. I guess you could say, Jesus, help me to realize that friends don't let friends go to hell. So I'm hoping in a few minutes when we celebrate communion that you'll take that time to remember, to reflect, to confess, and then to recommit, saying, Jesus, I will follow you. Jesus, I will represent you. Jesus, I will proclaim you. Because we celebrate communion to remember, reflect, and recommit. 
Now, in just a moment, I'm going to invite everyone who's a, a Jesus follower to, uh, you know, in the room and at home, if you're joining us online, to join us in remembering Jesus' death and resurrection. Uh, here in the room, it looks like this. Uh, after the prayer, I'm going to invite you to get up and move from your seats to one of the tables around the room. We have two at the front, two in the back. And uh, there, go get the elements and then return to your seat. Now, when you get the elements, there's two cups stacked in each other. One has the bread, one has the, the juice. And, and, and I want you to go back to your seat and, and take time to reflect. By the way, we're going to, you know, just have some quiet music playing for a while. And then we've got two worship songs. So you do not have to rush. Okay, you don't have to like get in line and push people and shove and like cuss them out, get out of my way. I got to remember Jesus. That's not really consistent anyway. <laughs> Come on, you know how it is. It, it, look, you, you, don't, you don't have to do that. You don't have to stand in line judging the people around you. Uh, we want you to be thinking about Jesus while you're waiting to get the elements. When you get back to your seat, we don't want you to hurry. We want you to really take some time to remember what Christ has done for you to reflect on your life before him and confess and then to recommit. And I really do hope that you will pray, Jesus, I want to follow you better. Jesus, I want to represent you better. Jesus, I want to proclaim you to people who don't know you. Maybe pray for some of your friends and family. And then when you're ready to surrender again to Jesus, you eat the bread because Jesus said, this is my body broken or given for you. You drink the cup because Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And you worship your Savior. So um, recommit to follow, to represent, proclaim Jesus because that's the purpose of communion. Um, I realize that the theology is going to continue to divide us, but the love of Christ and the mission of life change, I hope and pray, will matter more and bring us together. Let's pray together. Father, it is a miracle that you love us. I mean, you know our faults, our failures, you know our weaknesses, and yet you consistently uh, demonstrate your love, not just through the death uh, and resurrection of Jesus, but through your patience with us in our lives, for your acts of kindness and blessings and redemption that we experience day after day after day. So God, open our eyes to that. And I pray that you would meet us here in power with your Holy Spirit right now. That as we pause to remember and to reflect and to recommit, that you would speak to our hearts God, I ask that you'd make us uncomfortable and convict us of sin. I pray that you'd bring comfort and, and give us grace. God, I pray that you would uh, meet us at our point of commitment because we want to honor you and we want to follow you. And God, I pray that when we leave this place, we will do so having worshiped the King of kings and Lord of lords, having basked in the wonder of your grace and mercy and with a burning desire to represent you and to proclaim you to our friends and family and this community. This is our prayer. We ask it in the name of the one who gave everything to save us, Jesus Christ. Amen.